Hello and welcome to Books in the World. Hi, I'm Nancy Richard and I'm your host today. And today in the studio, I'm with Jenna Blum, who is the New York best, uh, Times bestselling author, one of Oprah Winfrey's top 30 women writers and author of The Lost Family. <laughs> um, congratulations on your new novel and welcome. And thank you so much for being on the show with us today. Oh, thank you so much for having me. Um, I just finished reading your book and also listening to it, and it was absolutely wonderful. Um, I enjoyed it so much. And um, one of the things that I noticed about your book, particularly other than it's extremely well written and, oh, thank you. and very honestly written as well, um, I'd like to know um, what inspired you to write this novel? Thanks, Nancy. Um, well, I should probably give maybe a thumbnail sketch for yes. readers, and the book is, is out only since June 2018, so it's still an infant book. So uh -huh. I don't anticipate that everybody in the world has read it, although I certainly hope that they do eventually. The Lost Family is about a German-Jewish concentration camp survivor named Peter Rashkin, who emigrates to the States after the war, starts an iconic restaurant called Masha's on the Upper East Side, on which all the menu items are an homage to his dead wife, whom he lost mm -hmm. during the war. Um, and he, despite his better instincts, enters a courtship with a young model, 20 years his junior, named June Bouquet, who's an immigrant herself from the Midwest, where her last name is pronounced Bucket. Bucket. <laughs> and um, <laughs> Peter is really struck by June, and so he begins a sort of passionate um, courtship with her, even though he is vowed never to get involved with anybody ever again because of the wife and twin toddlers he lost during the war. So Peter's um, section of the book is all about ambivalence and June gets her own section um, when she's Peter's wife, which is not a spoiler because it's on the flyleaf. Um, and then their daughter Elsbeth also gives a bird's eye view on her parents' marriage in 1985 and sheds some light on what it's like to be the child of a Holocaust survivor who very much keeps himself buttoned up. Mm -hmm. So I came to write the novel because in the late 90s, I interviewed Holocaust survivors for four years for the Steven Spielberg Survivors of the Shoah Foundation. Mm -hmm. I interviewed 60 plus survivors, wow. and I used none of their stories for any of my novels because they don't belong to me. Those are hallowed ground. But Peter's story was inspired by actual events, as they say, on TV. Mm -hmm. um, I interviewed a survivor who like Peter, was a chef in his native country before the war, but he was very famous. Peter is an aspiring chef. The real man was like the Anthony Bourdain of Prague. And then the Nazis oh. came, and he survived several camps, including Theresienstadt and Auschwitz, emigrated to the States, and the only job he could find was as a busboy, from which he was then fired because his camp tattoo from Auschwitz upset the American Designers. And the gentleman I interviewed tossed this off almost anecdotally, and compared to some of the things he had described prior to emigrating, I suppose it didn't really seem that awful to him. Mm. But this cruel little irony stuck with me that you could endure the unimaginable, make it to what you thought was a safe place, and then find yourself still imprisoned by not being able to tell people what had happened to you, even if they wanted to know. And a lot of times Americans didn't want to know what mm -hmm. had happened during the war um, to their Jewish counterparts overseas. So I started thinking about the refugee part of a survivor's story. I think in my mind, before I started doing the interviews, and certainly before that interview, I was thinking, okay, you know, once people survive the camps, it's kind of like the end of the movie. You get like roll credits, there's happy music, you walk out of the gates, you come to America, everything is hunky-dory. <laughs> but I started thinking about what it would be like to be a young man or woman emigrating to a foreign country in your late teens, early 20s, not knowing the language, having to learn it from TV or radio or movies, which was how most of my survivors learned, mm -hmm. and having lost everybody you knew, your immediate family, extended family, your friends, all your friends wiped out, and even, in, like in Peter's case, a young wife and children, how would you start over again in this new landscape in which you were sort of mute and miserable? How do you find the strength to go on, and is there such a thing as a fresh start? Mm. So. I started working with Peter, 
and I went to a reading in Florida, and uh -huh. somebody asked me, what are you working on, which is a very popular question, <laughs> and I told them. And afterwards, in the signing line, a lady came up to me, and she had tears in her eyes, and she said, I implore you that in addition to writing about this man whose story is so important, please write about the family. My husband's father is a survivor, and we revere my father-in-law. We love him. He's totally emotionally locked down, and my husband has suffered his whole life because of it. Mm -hmm. So I implore you to please think about the consequences of the survivor's trauma for the families. And I felt like the universe had given me a little God wink because mm -hmm. I was already sketching out the stories of Peter's young American wife, June, who loves her dashing older European husband, has no idea what his European life was like or mm -hmm. his war years, because he won't talk about it. Um, and she also doesn't know from Judaism because she's what my grandparents would have called a shiksa. Mm -hmm. And I started thinking about what it would be like to be a survivor's daughter, mm -hmm. be a daddy's girl as I was, love your dad more than anything, and know that he loves you, but also that he has two other little girls that he has lost and with whom he is always locked in his own mind. Mm -hmm. So the lost family became a story about how a whole family reacts to trauma. And believe it or not, that's the short answer to the question of how I came to write the novel. <laughs> well, it was really interesting. Um, there are a lot of very um, insightful parts in this book that engaged my attention. Um, one of them was, you know, you've got this this man who has had a lot of his history, a lot of trauma, uh, and you've got this young woman who is kind of fresh off the bus, really. Yeah. I yeah. mean, she's, she really has not had a lot of challenge in her life. Her biggest challenge was getting on that bus and going to New York, but she already had a place to go. She didn't have to suffer the starving artist type thing. She just kind of fell into it. And so she's got this fresh perspective where everything is rosy and wonderful, and she's just on the cusp of the women's live movement, and things are kind of, in, she's really in the zone. And then there's Peter, um, who ha is 45, she's 25, he's 45, and he's had this whole other life. And there's such a mismatch in so many ways. I, I, I had a very hard time with June in the beginning of the book because I was looking at her like, oh my gosh, this, this woman is, she has no idea what she's getting into. And he is looking at her like, oh, this is my fresh start. This is mm -hmm. a clean slate. I can start all over again. And yet there's so much stopping him from doing it. He's so fearful of putting himself out there. And I, I just found that, I, I, I just wondered how you came up with this matching of this. This came out of your head. How did this happen? <laughs> <laughs> it came partly out of my history because my mom came from a small farm town in the Midwest where I now actually have a family home. Uh -huh. And the town appears in all of my books as New Heidelberg. So it's my only recurring character to date. My mom's ticket from this town to get her on the bus, and she literally did come on a bus, was not being a model like June. She was a pianist and she had a scholarship oh. to Juilliard. Mm -hmm. And she, like June, had her path sort of paved for her because she had been handed like this, this Wonka ticket for anybody who wants to live in a bigger city, which she did. She always wanted to go to New York. And she got there and she was you know, dating. It was the end of the 60s and she had been raised to be a wife and a mom. And she was like, hell no, I'm gonna be a pianist and I'm gonna go to Juilliard. I'm gonna have a European world tour. And mm -hmm. she had the talent and the chops. And then she met my dad while she was dating all these other guys, you know, like going, sitting at chock full of nuts in a mini skirt and going to Trader Vic's at night and falling backwards off the bar stools, going to Studio 54. So these were like the myths that I grew up on in mm -hmm. my childhood. And she and my dad met at a dinner party and my dad was 10 years older mm -hmm. um, and he had been born and raised in Westchester. So n not with any of Peter's baggage, but came from a very different culture oh, yeah. from my mom. So my mom's people are all German, Norwegian, Lutheran farmers. Mm -hmm. And then my dad's people are all New York, Westchester Jews. And my grandfather, my dad's dad, was a big macher who, you know, mm -hmm. was a plumber's son who raised himself up to be a Madison Avenue lawyer. The sole character. That's a, yes, exactly. <laughs> it's, it's like Saul is my grandfather. He would be the first person to tell you he was a big uh -huh. macher. So I basically lifted my grandfather out of my <laughs> life and put him in the book as Saul. And I, uh -huh. I found him, I've always found him fascinating. So it was delightful to write about him. But I 
you know, was a, obviously a close observer of my parents' marriage for many years, and mm -hmm. I was always struck by they were so fond of each other, just as people. Like, my dad respected my mom's talent. My mom respected my dad's talent. He was a writer for CBS mm -hmm. and NBC and ABC, but when she met him, he was writing for Cronkite. So here's, like Peter, this dazzling older man who's at the peak of his career, sought after by a lot of women. He chooses a woman who's talented, but as you said, right off the bus. Um, and so that was kind of my model for that courtship. Like mm -hmm. they are remarkably mismatched. Uh -huh. um, and yet they have a sort of thistle-like in its strength, a sort of tensile respect for each other at the core and a fondness for each other, even though, as you know, their marriage proves, like their mismatch is very prevalent. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I, this is one of the questions that I did have for you. Um, as I was reading, especially the beginning two sections, because they're so far long ago. I mean, you weren't even alive in 1965, so. That is true. <laughs> <laughs> I had to think about that for a minute. I I'm like, how much am I gonna admit to here? Yeah, I don't, I, I, I was absolutely, I was absolutely taken aback by the fact that you could actually make the reader taste it, smell it, feel it, it, everything it was just it was just so there and the descriptions were just amazing I, I love the way you describe things thank you and in 1975 also because I was a kid in 1965 but in 1975 I was an adult and so I can remember the way it tasted and the way it smelled and how the cameras you know, the pictures were always sort of red in retrospect and all <laughs> that's that right. stuff yeah and so I, I was wondering what what were your sources on this because it was so accurate you, you couldn't possibly have known it firsthand so thank you well that is my job as somebody who writes historical uh -huh. fiction although the final section of the book is 85 and I am aghast to realize that this is classified as historical fiction. Yeah, um, but I didn't yeah. want to bring that up. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> um, and I was alive in 85 and I came of age like Elspeth did. Like she's born in my same year in 70. So that uh, section I could draw upon my own life for the research. The Swatch Watch. The Swatch Everybody Watch. Had I had those. a Swatch with several yeah. bands. And my parents were generous, so I had, you know, many, like a band for every day of the week mm -hmm. and the Capizios and the socks that you wore on the outside of your jeans and all this cool kid stuff. My hair, because I grew up in New Jersey in the 80s, was like bigger than mm -hmm. my whole head. So right. on one side of my face, my hair was like bigger than my head. Um, and I also got to, you know, text <laughs> my friends from high school who appear in the novel. Um, and say to them, you know, remind me of this slang, like I have bodacious tatas in there, but like what am I missing, you know? So it was, it was really fun to do a hat tip to that era uh -huh. and the things that I cherished about it and the things that were tough. Mm -hmm. um, but the 60s and 70s, I was a child in the 70s and I remember, you know, my Oshkosh and Free to Be You and Me, but to think about it from the adult perspective, to sort of work backwards and answer your question, um, my research methods are sort of immersive. Mm -hmm. One of my readers very kindly called them method research, but they could probably more accurately be called craziness. I mean, I really try to go recreate the time as much as I can. So yeah. I get into my sort of like mental time machine. And in order to do this, I surround myself with as much sensory uh, input as possible. So I start by reading about the eras, 65 and 75 respectively for June and Peter. Um, I would like print out a Wikipedia page, 1965. What did, everything that happened in that year, what's important? What do I need to know? What were the top songs? What were the top books? What were the top restaurants, the top dishes? I downloaded images from that uh -huh. year. So what people were wearing, what they were driving, TV advertisements, TV guide. Um, part of Peter's section takes place in the blackout section, blackout of I November that. 65. Yeah, I do. So many readers have written to me to say, oh my gosh, I remember that blackout. I was on a bus. I was on the subway. I was in New York. It was scary. Right? Yeah, and I just remember it because I was a kid, but I remember it because um, the whole eastern seaboard went out. Yeah. It was really, really it dark. It was traumatic for people. Well, you know, <laughs> yeah. the images I had of my on my image board of the blackout were dark so yes. there was like you know these black squares on my image board but mm -hmm. um so i basically had my study wallpapered with all of these images mm -hmm. um i recreated the recipes or actually created the recipes for peter's restaurant masha's so i spent a whole summer happily procrastinating 
you know, reading chef uh -huh. memoirs, reading um, German cookbooks for Peter's background, Jewish cookbooks you for like his background. Cook, I love to cook. Yeah. I taste tested all the recipes on my fiance, who did not mind at all. Let oh, me tell you, sure and my black didn't. lab, who also enjoyed it. <laughs> um, and black lab. Yeah, he was. Yeah, he was like, "Can you please make more of the bread?" I'm, no, I'm they in just love sit with there the bread and their tails are going. Plop, 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 <laughs> and he was like, he's, he was 13 at the time, and he was like. Oh. I will pull my creaky old body into the kitchen, food falling from the sky. Uh -huh. Oh, this is so great. <laughs> um, and so, and I listened to the music. I had Spotify playlists for all the characters. Um, mm -hmm. I reread all the bestsellers from those years. And for a brief period of insanity, when I'm actually writing the characters, I dress like them, although not Peter, because I didn't feel like wearing a suit. I don't do a good Marlena Dietrich look. But mm -hmm. um, for June, I had bell bottoms, a t-shirt that said feminist, clogs, and a bandana. So my fiance was like, okay, I see we're in the 70s today. And I was like, peace out, man. We're going yeah. back. Yeah. Yeah, white well, lipstick. I had I had very pale lipstick. <laughs> I have go-go boots. Like today, I don't know if you could see them, but I have like thigh-high leather boots and homage to June. There was some shopping involved with my research. Uh, yeah, that's somebody, always good, too. Somebody's got to do it. Yeah, so. what, a sh what a shame, huh? Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, all of this helps me to, I hope, recreate for the reader a world that is so alive in a sensory sense, like mm -hmm. what you can see, feel, hear, taste, and smell, that after you walk out of my book, I hope you're leaving with memories of those worlds as well as the character's experiences. Oh, well, That's it worked for me. Well, thank goodness. Thank <laughs> yeah. you. Um, when, um, when did you start writing? Um, did you always want to be a writer, or were you planning to be maybe an astronaut <laughs> no. or a ballerina or a chef? Oh, my God, certainly not a ballerina. <laughs> it's like my one anti-skill is like okay, I can sing yeah. and I can do lots of other stuff, but I cannot dance. Um, my parents made me take tap. It was it was oh. ugly. Um, <laughs> I always wanted to be a writer since I was four. Oh. Because of my dad, as I mentioned, he was a writer for CBS mm -hmm. and then later NBC and ABC. And so I grew up listening to the sound of his typewriter. Hopefully uh -huh. everybody still remembers what a yep. typewriter is. It's not just an app. Yep. Um, and so all I wanted to do was grow up to be a writer like my dad. And my parents encouraged me, thankfully. I know many creatives whose parents to not encourage them and said, when are you going to get a real job? Yeah. You're never going to be able to make a living. They think they're going to be supporting you for the rest of your Basically, yeah. and my dad probably had like resigned himself to, to that. that. Yes, he used to sing along a, a song from My Fair Lady about um, uh, lots of Doolittle's dad sings this song about like with a little bit of luck when you, when they grow up they'll start supporting you and he would kind of whistle that meaningfully <laughs> when I was around but I mean honestly he would slip me money you know under the table every time he saw me and he would say things like Jen you know when you're a famous writer and you're seeing an old man walking down the street you know from a coffee shop and he you know he looks like he's down and out invite him in buy him a cup of coffee and that's how you'll repay me. And he was like, because that old man will be me because I'll be broke from giving you money. But <laughs> right. you know, he, he did subsidize me. So um, yeah, my parents encouraged me. I won the 17 National Fiction Contest when I was 16. Um, Oops. <laughs> and and uh, thought the world owed me a living as a writer. So I got a BA in English. Uh -huh. Discovered that the world owed me a living in food service, which is what I then did for 15 years while I was subsidizing my expensive writing habit. and. I just kept um, writing short stories by day mm -hmm. um, and working in restaurants by night, which is where a lot of the restaurant experience for Lost Family comes in. So writers repurpose everything. Oh, of course. I was a waitress, a Vacuum hostess, a prep up. chef, a right. sous chef. I had to wear a hat with shaped like a garlic clove for one job. And oh. I have more scars on my hands than you can count from you know slicing them open, cutting lemons, cutting baguettes. Burns. You know, burns. Yeah, it's like a whole lexicon of, yeah. of, of uh, kitchen marks. And I love them. I am proud of them. Um, and I guess um, one great thing about writing is that it allows you to live alternate lives. And although I will not be a chef because I just don't have the extra spark that really good chefs need. Their cre my creativity goes into my books. Theirs goes into their beautiful food. Yeah. Um, but I loved living the alternate life of a mm -hmm. chef through Peter. Oh, that must have been fun. It was a delight. Yeah, yeah I it still am sort fun. of in Masha's in my head. Aha. So what's next for you? The next book I'm going to write is, um, usually I don't know the answer to this question, but I'm thrilled to say that I do. And it's a prequel sequel to 
The Lost Family. Mm -hmm. It will also be a standalone. So if people don't read The Lost Family, although of course I highly Hopefully. recommend of they course. do, of course. Um, but if they don't, they'll still be able to pick up the next book and hopefully enjoy it. Mm -hmm. But it will showcase Peter's life as a very young man in Berlin when um, the Nazis were just coming to power. So before Hitler really attained power in 39, I want to showcase 33 through 39 mm -hmm. because I want to show what happens to Peter and his new wife and eventually their children when their rights start to erode. And how yeah. does that happen in a society? That was, that was actually one of my questions before we got started, but I, I, I left it out because I'm going to save it for the next time I interview you okay, <laughs> after okay. the next book. But okay. it, is, it is a fascinating thing and it, somebody described it once as a uh, frog in a frying pan or in a, in a kettle and you turn on the water and it, it, you're in the frogs in the cold water in the kettle and it gets hotter and hotter and by the time it's it realizes that it's imperiled it's too it's late, too late. to jump out. I wonder I mean that it strikes me as very similar to what a, a man in, in uh, Germany told me last May he had grown up in Germany um, was born during the war like in the 40s and remembered that time and he was touring us. He had, was then a police um, prefect in Berchtesgaden where Hitler mm -hmm. had his eagle's nest. And he was touring um, me and a bunch of readers around um, the eagle's nest one day. And then he and I were standing by ourselves waiting for the rest of the group looking at the remains of the bunker and there isn't much left. And he, I looked over and I saw that he was crying. I mean, this was like a man in his late 70s in his great coat, you know, still mm -hmm. and very distinguished. And, and he had tears running down his face. And I said, you know, was is, was is los? And what is wrong? And he said, I'm so ashamed of what happened here. I'm so ashamed. And then he said, be very careful. You will not believe how fragile democracy is and, and how, how quickly this it is. goes. He said it goes yeah. very slowly at first, and then it goes in an instant. But I, my question that I want to explore in the next book, at least in that part of Peter's life, because there's also a, a counterpart um, sequel, mm -hmm. is what if the frog knows it's in the water? Like, what do you do if you are a frog and you're like, oh, the water's getting lukewarm and it's kind of hot, but I'm just one frog and I can't, this pot's really steep. How do I get out of the pot? Mm -hmm. I feel like sometimes people recognize that they're imperiled even as it is happening and the heat is being turned up. What do you do about it mm -hmm. if you're only one person? What, what can you do? What that's, can you do? That's, tr that's, that's a very good question. And I, I know from friends that I have that live in Germany and family that live in Germany that there is a lot of shame for the situation. People who lived through this era are embarrassed to talk about it and horrified that it happened, and yet they're mostly their response was to duck and try to stay out of the limelight because they all felt like they were going to be murdered too. Mm -hmm. So it, it was a very difficult, difficult time. Um, one last little question I have before okay. we wrap up is you have wampum around your neck oh. and you said you had something to say I about do. that. I do. I do have wampum. Oops, sorry. It's like behind my hair, of, of which I have entirely too much. So I have this beautiful necklace. Um, a friend of mine made it. Um, his name is Liz Smith. She's an artisan. Mm -hmm. And on Twitter, she is at Smith Dry Goods, I think. Mm -hmm. um, and she made this because there's a section in the book in which Peter is obsessed with wampum, which he discovers when he comes to America. And that's in there because I love wampum and I mm -hmm. grew to know it from my family vacations on Cape Cod and the islands when I was a little girl. So I was delighted to give a hat tip to those early happy memories in the novel. And then my friend made me this beautiful necklace to wear on tour while I was going out with the Lost family. So it's like almost a good luck charm It's, too, it's huh? my good luck charm, yeah. yeah. I wear it every time I do a reading, I wear it, whether you see it or not. It's like tucked away somewhere. So. Or it's under your hair. <laughs> or it's under my hair. It's under your exactly, hair. Exactly, exactly. TSA is like, what? What is that? Yeah. It's wampum, uh, dude. It's yeah. wonderful. Yeah, thank yeah. you. I, I really enjoyed so much reading your book, and I, I, I want to thank, thank you so much for coming in today to be on Books in the World. It's such a pleasure to meet you, and I'm thank hoping you. I'll get to talk with you again for the next book, too. I so hope so. Um, to our viewers, I highly recommend The Lost Family to any reader that enjoys writing that is honest and human, emotionally challenging, and well-researched. It's a great book for book clubs with lots of material for discussion, and the story will stay f with you for a long time after you've finished it. So thank you for joining us, and have a good day.